um, specifically the uh, Akulam excitation experiment of cadmium 106 and the interpretation of those results in light of uh, kind of questions of emerging collectivity. Um, so usually when, when we talk about emerging collectivity, we start from uh, the perspective of the seniority scheme uh, and nuclei where, where we talk about seniority are usually on closed shells. Uh, so at least kind of semi-magic nuclei where we're only talking about one kind of valence uh, nucleon. So either valence protons or valence neutrons. And the way the scheme works is basically in terms of uh, talking about broken pairs of valence nucleons. So for example, uh, it, it looks something like this on the left here, uh, where nu is the number that represents uh, the number of, of broken nucleons. Uh, and so when all of the nucleons are paired, you have a zero plus ground state. And then if you take one of those pairs of nucleons and uh, break them up, uh, what you get is this uh, quintuplet of states that corresponds to all of the allowed spin couplings between that pair of nucleons. So for example, if they are in the H11 halves orbital, uh, then that looks like two plus, four plus, six plus, eight plus, and 10 plus. Uh, and then typically you introduce some sort of uh, interaction. So like a delta interaction or a pairing interaction uh, that will break the degeneracy uh, of, of this multiplet of states. And you get something that looks a little bit more like the picture on the right here, uh, where you have the, the increasing spin at the top uh, and then kind of the spacing increasing as you go all the way down to the ground state. And so experimentally, uh, that can look something like this. Uh, these are the energy systematics uh, of the neutron rich tin isotopes. Uh, and you can see the sequence of 10 plus states all the way at the top, uh, which are all isomeric states. Uh, and then the, the splitting uh, right on the right here corresponds to the seniority scheme uh, with just one pair of H11 halves holes uh, outside of 10132. And then you track these states as we go across towards the middle of the shell uh, and you see the spacing uh, increases uh, as you add more and more uh, valence nucleons. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I'll talk a little bit about in terms of comparing some of these different models, which is a very basic observable, uh, is the ratio between the four plus and two plus energies. Uh, and so for the seniority scheme with pairing, uh, this ratio is one and a half. Uh, and you can kind of see that that's, you know, just by eye, uh, fairly close to being the case for 10, 130. Uh, and then as you move towards the middle of the shell, uh, that kind of moves to a, to a ratio that's closer to uh, two to one. Uh, and in terms of uh, E2 excitation strengths, uh, which is uh, what I'll spend a lot of time talking about today, uh, this is the, the classic kind of parabolic shape that you get in the seniority scheme. Uh, so these are the, the systematics of the first excited uh, two plus state B2 um, across the 10 isotopic chain. And you can see that it uh, clearly has this, this maximum and this characteristic shape uh, at the middle of the shell. Uh, so that's seniority. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, we, we will often talk about uh, collective nuclei, strongly collective nuclei. Uh, and these are uh, essentially talked about as rotation. Uh, so this is where we have uh, some deformation. Uh, the nucleus is no longer spherical in shape. Uh, we will usually have or always have uh, both shells open. So lots of valence protons and lots of valence neutrons. Uh, and we have this collective motion where all of the nuclei are working together uh, to form these collective uh, excitations. And so here are some uh, kind of typical uh, figures of, of what that looks like to give you a picture. Um, so this, this picket fence gamma ray spectrum uh, comes from the fact that all of the energy levels are described by uh, this equation in the top right here, uh, where the excitation energy is dependent on uh, the moment of inertia uh, and uh, the angular momentum times the angular momentum plus one. Uh, and this gives you uh, the four to two ratio of three and a third, um, as opposed to the one and a half uh, from the seniority scheme. Uh, and the other very important thing about these nuclei is that you have these very strongly enhanced B2 transitions. Um, so this, this data, I believe, is from Coulomb excitation. 
Uh, and, and when you do this Coulomb excitation, you kind of excite all the way up these rotational bands uh, and then see all of the decays uh, back down. Uh, and that basically comes from the fact that there are many, many nucleons involved uh, in these rotational excitations. And so the big question uh, of emerging collectivity is what lies in between these two extremes uh, of seniority nuclei and rotational nuclei. Uh, and for a long time, uh, the typical uh, thought process or the typical answer to this would have been uh, spherical vibrations. Uh, so this is weakly collective nuclei that perhaps have uh, a few valence protons or neutrons, so maybe uh, maybe the cadmium chain or the tellurium chain, uh, where you've only got two valence protons, uh, and then you kind of track it uh, across the, the various numbers of valence neutrons. Um, and, and this is kind of the so-called weak collectivity, which is in between these two extremes. And so uh, the vibrational scheme uh, works by building up phonons, uh, which are kind of the basic unit of uh, of vibration. Uh, and so at the most basic level, you have a one phonon excitation, uh, which is your first excited two plus state. Uh, and then to that, you can add a second phonon. And when you do that, you get a degenerate set of three states uh, with spins zero plus, two plus, and four plus. And then if you add, go even further and add a third phonon, uh, you get a quintuplet of states uh, with zero plus, two plus, three plus, four plus, uh, and six plus. Uh, and uh, the, the numbers for the transitions here represent uh, transition strengths, um, all, all relative to the first phonon excitation. And so you can see that uh, for, the, for all of the two phonon to one phonon transitions, uh, you should have a B2 strength, which is twice uh, that of, of the first phonon excitation. Uh, and then all of these various strengths for the three phonon to two phonon transitions uh, come from the angular momentum of algebra and, and kind of fall out of, of the algebra of the model. Um, but once again, we'll often talk about the ratio of, of the four plus to two plus energy. Uh, and in this case, it should be two to one. Um, so the two phonon uh, states or triplet uh, at twice the energy of the first excited state. Um, and so when, when it comes to talking about which isotopes uh, have typically been thought of as good vibrational candidates, uh, the cadmium isotopes uh, immediately spring to mind. Um, so there are a few excerpts from various papers here, uh, Arima and Iacello saying that cadmium-110 seems to be uh, a very good candidate for the vibrational limit. Uh, and you can see the, the level scheme on the left here. You can, very clearly from this, see why you would think that's the case just from the energies. Uh, you've got the zero plus ground state, the first excited two plus state, and then at almost twice the energy, uh, this nearly degenerate triplet of four plus two plus and zero plus states. Uh, once again, this review paper in 95 saying that 110 cadmium has especially been considered one of the best examples of nuclei that exhibit in five symmetry, uh, which is of, uh, which is the, the uh, vibrational limit of the interacting boson model. Uh, and then this paper on the bottom here as well, uh, looking at the spectroscopy of cadmium-118 uh, and proposing that as a, a very good candidate for a harmonic vibrator, uh, identifying the three phonon states uh, in that nucleus. Of course, uh, nature is never quite that kind to us uh, and things are in fact slightly more complicated. Uh, so what you can see here is the systematics of, of energy levels across the cadmium isotopes. And we've got the first excited two plus state in blue here, uh, and then two sequences of zero plus states that I've labeled zero A and zero B because they, uh, there's, a, there's a level crossing um, that are quite close together in energy. Uh, and so, for example, for cadmium-110, uh, the, the first excited zero plus state would be the candidate for uh, the two phonon excitation in the vibration model. But then, of course, there's a question of what the second excited zero plus state is uh, just a little bit higher in energy. Uh, is this uh, the, the third phonon zero plus state uh, that's been pushed down in energy, uh, or is this something else entirely? And so one of the things that we can look at uh, to to give insight into what the character of these states may be uh, is this reaction here, which is a helium three N two proton transfer reaction. Uh, so this is where we start with palladium isotopes. We transfer protons to cadmium 
uh, and see what states would populate. And this population mechanism is interesting uh, because it is going to preferentially populate intruder states. Uh, so if you're not familiar, uh, intruder states are where you, you would take two protons that are below the Z equals 50 shell closure uh, and raise them all the way up above that. And obviously there's a very large uh, energy cost to doing that because you're crossing uh, that, that Z equals 50 shell gap. Uh, but in some cases, the, the pairing correlations uh, mean that the energies of those states can come down uh, and, and be in the region that we're talking about here. And so all that to say uh, that uh, when you do this helium 3N transfer, uh, populating states in the cadmium isotopes, what you see is a very strong population of uh, the, the first excited uh, zero plus states in both cadmium 110 and 112, uh, which is shown on the right here. And that's very interesting because that kind of indicates that, that these states are in fact intruder in character uh, as opposed to being two phonon vibrations. And so coming back to the systematic plot, uh, you can see that I've, I've marked in red circles the states uh, that correspond to strong population uh, by this two proton transfer. And so this has been known uh, for some time uh, and the standard approach to resolving this conundrum uh, is to invoke strong mixing. And so basically we say that we have a two phonon, uh, a two phonon configuration, zero plus, uh, and a, an intruder zero plus configuration, and they mix strongly. Uh, and from that mixing, uh, we get a coherent combination uh, and an incoherent combination. Uh, and if we do that correctly, we can explain both the decay patterns of those two states uh, and the population through the two proton transfer mechanism. Um, however, uh, this paper from Paul Garrett in 2008 uh, kind of looked very uh, systematically across the, the chain of cadmium isotopes and looked at all the spectroscopy uh, and basically concluded that this explanation was not sufficient uh, to provide a holistic description uh, of what was going on. Uh, and of particular note uh, was, was one observation here uh, that I've highlighted, which basically says that when you have a, a positive interaction uh, matrix element for this mixing, uh, what you're always going to get is the coherent combination being lower in energy than the incoherent combination. That's you know very simple uh, two-state mixing. However, uh, you note that there is this uh, crossing between the two states, uh, cadmium 116. And so essentially what that means is that if these states are coming from the strong mixing, there's no way that you can have this level crossing occurring, um, even though it's seen uh, strongly in experiment. Uh, you add to that uh, some work that's been done by uh, Mitch uh, at Oak Ridge. Uh, so this is, this is using the, the Haifa reactor at Oak Ridge to activate um, a, a silver foil, which uh, produces uh, metastable uh, silver 110, uh, which decays into cadmium 110. And so what you can do with this is you can, you can go looking for transitions between the nominal uh, vibrational candidate states, which are on the left here, and the intruder candidate states, which are on the right. And what you should see uh, if these two configurations are indeed strongly mixed uh, is that these have quite large transition strengths uh, because of that mixing. What you see in experiment, however, uh, is that the transition strengths are very weak. And so uh, compared to the 44 Weisskopf units expected for the red transition, we have only 0.2 um, and, and similarly uh, a large discrepancy for the blue transition as well. And so um, then, uh, you know, continuing forward with the story of, of the cadmium isotopes, we have this paper, a PRL uh, from Paul Garrett again, uh, in which he reports spectroscopy of both cadmium 110 and 112 and interprets this not in the light of uh, spherical vibrations, uh, but instead uh, reports some beyond mean field calculations and interprets these nuclei in light of multiple shape coexistence. And so you see here uh, the proposed picture for cadmium 110, 
uh, where this zero plus, two plus, and four plus uh, triplet at around 100 uh, or one and a half MeV, uh, rather than being uh, vibrational two phonon states, uh, these are the four plus ground state band, uh, a two plus uh, band head of a gamma band, uh, and then an intruder as the zero plus. And so this brings us to cadmium 106, which of course uh, is, is the focus of what I'm talking about today. Cadmium 106 has two valence proton holes uh, from Z equals 50 uh, and eight valence neutrons away from uh, N equals 50. And so one of the nice things about cadmium 106 as opposed to these mid-shell cadmium isotopes is that it's close enough to N equals 50 to do shell model calculations. Uh, and that provides some, uh, some kind of microscopic lens uh, to, to be slightly different to these geometric uh, or algebraic models that uh, tend, to, uh, tend to be used at the mid-shell. Uh, the other thing that's important is that the intruder states uh, typically reach a minimum in energy at the middle of the shell. And so being uh, just a few steps back towards, uh, towards N equals 50 means that the intruders for cadmium 106 should be higher in energy. Uh, and this means less mixing with the intrinsic configuration of the ground state. And so that hopefully should uh, simplify the interpretation somewhat. Uh, and additionally, there's, there's been some recent, ice, uh, some recent interest in cadmium 106. We've got uh, magnetic moments and lifetime measurements uh, in the top here from 2016. And these lifetime measurements were in disagreement with uh, some of the previous Coolex measurements. A, uh, a multi-step Coolum excitation measurement uh, in 2021 uh, that was published along with some shell model calculations, uh, and then more lifetime measurements uh, for, for a variety of cadmium isotopes using uh, Doppler recoil uh, kind of techniques, uh, which again were published with some theory calculations along the same lines as uh, the Paul Garrett uh, PRL paper. Uh, and so I'll, I'll give you a quick overview of the experiment uh, and, and kind of the technique and how it works and what we're trying to measure and why. Uh, the general idea is that we have a cadmium 106 beam uh, that is incident on a lead 208 target. Uh, the lead 208 and cadmium nuclei recoil uh, being uh, the cadmium hopefully being excited uh, to some higher excited state uh, in the process of its interaction with lead 208. As it recoils, it decays back to the ground state emitting a gamma ray that we can detect. We also detect the lead 208 and cadmium 106 nuclei, and so in that way we can reconstruct the kinematics of the reaction uh, and Doppler correct that gamma ray uh, to get back to a, a nice clean spectra. And the idea of this uh, is that what we want to measure is BE2 strengths or excitation strengths, uh, quadrupole moments uh, for some of the low-lying states. Uh, and, and all of these are E2 matrix elements. Uh, and then we can use those E2 matrix elements to construct what are called rotational invariants. Uh, and these give us uh, shape independent or model independent shape information uh, about what the nucleus is. And to do this all from an experimental perspective, uh, we use uh, the Gratina uh, for the gamma rays uh, and Chico2 for detecting the particles. Um, so if you're not familiar, this is a, a very quick two-slide um, explanation of Coulomb excitation. Uh, basically, the idea is that uh, we keep the beam energy low uh, as opposed to many other things. Uh, and what that will do is ensure that the projectile and target nuclei uh, don't get too close to each other. They pass uh, far apart from each other. And what that means is that we don't need to worry about the nuclear interaction uh, coming into play. Uh, and we can basically calculate uh, the results of, of this collision uh, using purely the electromagnetic interaction. And so the matrix elements that are governing the excitation uh, in terms of which states we populate in the cadmium nucleus are exactly the same matrix elements uh, that are governing its decay. Uh, that is to say, the, the fundamental electromagnetic matrix elements of the nucleus itself. And so sometimes when we run this, uh, sometimes when we, when we have this collision happening, uh, we will excite some state in cadmium, uh, it will decay back and we'll detect it. But most of the time, what will happen is not that. Most of the time, we will simply have Rutherford or elastic scattering happening. Uh, and the ratio of these two tells us something about the probability uh, for cool X to occur. Uh, and so 
using some, some calculation, uh, we can relate that probability back uh, to the fundamental matrix elements that we want to measure. In reality, uh, for this experiment, uh, what we do is not quite uh, like that. Uh, what this would be called is, is Rutherford or absolute normalization, uh, because we are, we are normalizing this, uh, this occurrence on the top uh, to the Rutherford scattering uh, on the bottom. In reality, what we do here uh, is we use the coolex of a known transition in the nucleus. So for example, the, the first excited uh, two plus state, uh, we use that to normalize everything else that we see. Uh, and that kind of cancels out a lot of factors and it makes the analysis somewhat uh, simpler. And so once we have all of these E2 matrix elements, um, what, what do we do with them? Well, this is where the E2 rotational invariants come in. And I'll give a quick explanation uh, of, of the theory behind how that works. Uh, just a little bit of angular momentum algebra, but I won't uh, blame you if you tune out for this. Uh, so the, the E2 operator is a, uh, a spherical tensor operator. And so what that means is that we can couple multiple E2 operators together to form rank zero tensors. Uh, and so that's what this looks like here on the left. Uh, and the important thing is that rank zero tensors are rotationally invariant, they're scalars, right? Uh, and so by being rotationally invariant, it means that they are the same in the body frame of the nucleus as they are in the lab frame, right? So they kind of act as a bridge between things that we can actually measure in the lab and intrinsic nuclear information uh, that we really care about. Um, and so what I've done here is expressed uh, two such couplings of E2 matrix elements to rank zero tensors uh, in terms of the intrinsic body frame shape parameters Q, uh, which refers to the, uh, the deformation of the nucleus, and delta, which refers to the asymmetry or triaxiality. On the other hand, uh, we can also talk about uh, the expectation value uh, of this operator here uh, into, for, for some nuclear state S. And so we can do this expansion uh, and expand this, uh, this coupled operator in terms of a sum over intermediate states. And so these, these matrix elements here, these are things that we can actually measure with cool X. And so if we measure enough of these, then the sum converges, uh, and then we can relate this uh, back to uh, the expectation value for Q squared, i.e. Uh, the nuclear shape uh, that we can actually measure. And so in practice, what this looks like um, is usually something like this. So if we want to measure uh, the deformation for, say, the ground state of a nucleus, uh, well, we're going to need uh, four matrix elements, but it's really two matrix elements because the, the up and down are the same. Um, so we need the up strength, or we need the strength to the first excited two plus state and the strength to the second excited two plus state. And then we add those together, and that gives us the Q squared for the ground state. And this is essentially every path uh, of, of two matrix elements that gets us back to the ground state. Uh, when we go across to the right, if we wanted to measure the triaxiality, uh, we would have to have every combination of three matrix elements that gets us back to the ground state. So uh, we can go up to the first excited two plus state, we can reorient uh, on the first excited two plus state, which is uh, effectively the quadrupole moment of that state, uh, and then decay back down. We can do the same thing for the second excited two plus state. And then we have these triple paths uh, where we go up to one of the two plus states across to the second one uh, and then back down. And so these are kind of all of the matrix elements that we need uh, to be able to extract these, these shape parameters from experimental data. So as I mentioned before, uh, this experiment happened uh, using Gratina and Chico 2. And so you can see some pictures there uh, for Gratina with all of the quads in the background and that close packing uh, geometry. Uh, and then uh, in this bottom picture where uh, the target chamber is open, uh, you can see Chico on the inside. It's, a, it's an array of P packs, uh, which give really excellent uh, both angular coverage, which is very important, uh, and, uh, and position sensitivity because you need the angle uh, for the Doppler reconstruction. And so here are some, uh, some plots that show the performance uh, of those detectors. Uh, heat map showing all of the gamma ray hits uh, on Gratina uh, with the excellent position resolution that comes from the segmentation. 
for the setup that we used, uh, the efficiency was about 5% uh, at 1332 kV. Uh, and then uh, the, the equivalent, uh, the Chico two angular coverage on the right there uh, with full phi coverage and then um, very excellent theta coverage as well, uh, extending to the backwards angles, uh, which is very important uh, for the, for the multi-step higher excitations. And so here is uh, the particle identification plot, the PID plot uh, for the experiment. And so you can see two bands well separated, uh, one corresponding to cadmium 106 nuclei uh, and one corresponding to lead 208. And so this allows us to know where those recoils and what direction those recoils were going uh, and reconstruct uh, the gamma ray spectra uh, by, by Doppler correcting. And this is what we get uh, for the energy spectra. And you can see that I've divided it uh, into five different angular ranges. So this angle here corresponds to the particle theta angle. Uh, so starting at the top with the most forward focused cadmium nuclei, uh, and then kind of going back further to, to the back scattering nuclei. And you can kind of get an intuitive understanding for how this works uh, by, by just thinking about the collision. Uh, if you have a glancing collision where the cadmium nucleus is gonna continue going forward, uh, the interaction is, is weaker. You're not gonna get excitation to the higher states quite so much. Uh, whereas if you have a, a full head-on collision where the cadmium nuclei goes completely back, well then the, the two nuclear surfaces come closest together and you get the most excitation to the highest states. And so you can see that playing out very clearly where we start out uh, with the, the first excited state decay uh, and the four plus as well. And then as we go further and further backwards in theta angle, uh, you start to see population of the second excited two plus state creep in. Uh, the six plus state starts to pop up the first excited zero plus state uh, and then eventually a small hint uh, of the, the, the second excited zero plus state as well. And so uh, I take uh, the, the areas from, from all of these spectra for all of these different uh, angle ranges, and I put them into Gosha. And Gosha is a semi-classical Coulomb excitation program. And what Gosha does is takes a, uh, a level scheme uh, with matrix elements in it, along with some experimental parameters like you know, what, what, the, what the beam was, what the target was, what the energy was, what the energy loss through the target was, what angles the particle detectors were at, so on and so forth. And it calculates from that level scheme and matrix elements, a yield of gamma rays that we should see. Uh, and so we can then adjust the matrix elements until we get a good fit between the observed uh, yields from experiment uh, and the yields that Gosha is outputting. Uh, and then whatever the matrix elements are that, that gives us a good fit, well, that's, that's our measurement. Uh, in reality, the, the process of doing these fits can be very tricky. Uh, and to kind of demonstrate that, I've got a picture on the right that you can see. Uh, so each of the, the squares uh, in, this, in this picture correspond to a fit from Gosha, where I have fixed uh, the two matrix elements that are on the x-axis and the y-axis. So the, the two one to two one matrix element on the x-axis and the transition between the ground state and the second excited two plus state on the y-axis. Uh, and so I fix those and then I let Gosha fit all of the rest of the matrix elements in the level scheme uh, to whatever numbers give the best fit. Uh, and so you can see that there are two minima here uh, corresponding to positive and negative uh, transition matrix element values. Uh, but for both of those cases, uh, we can still put some reasonable limits on what uh, the, the 2, 1 to 2, 1 matrix element should be. Uh, and we can say something about what the magnitude of this transition uh, should be. Uh, the other thing to note, of course, is that the, the surface, the chi-squared surface that you get is not smooth at all. It's very bumpy. Uh, and so that makes it quite difficult to know whether you've converged uh, to the correct global minima uh, or you're just stuck in some local minima that's, that's not reasonable at all. Um, so this is a very laborious process that I'm not going to go into any more detail in. Uh, but needless to say, uh, the, when all is said and done, uh, the fits seem, uh, well, I have confidence that we've converged to the correct minimum. Uh, one of the things which is 
important about this data set uh, is that this is the first direct measurement of this matrix element here uh, between the first excited two plus state uh, and the first excited zero plus state. So there was a lifetime measurement uh, of this of the of the zero plus state uh, previously, uh, but the lifetime, of course, doesn't have any sensitivity to any unobserved transitions. Uh, for example, between uh, the the second two plus uh, state and the zero plus state. So the lifetime basically gives you the the integral uh, kind of all of the the transitions, all of the transition strength depopulating the state all at once. Uh, but what the cool X can give you is the differential uh, that is measuring the, the particular components individually because cool X works by excitation uh, rather than uh, just decay. And so you can see the equivalent plot here uh, on the right uh, where we've got uh, the, the matrix element that we want to measure uh, that is between the first excited two plus state and, and the excited zero plus state on the Y axis. Uh, and basically whatever this unobserved transition matrix element is, uh, we can still put some reasonable bounds uh, on this on this uh, important matrix element here. And so this is a summary of, of the results obtained um, with all of the matrix elements that we've measured uh, in this column here, and then compared to uh, a few different references uh, on the right. And in general, uh, the results compare fairly well uh, to previous literature. Uh, Important to note that this is uh, the first Coolex, uh, well, the first matrix elements from Coolex that's been reported uh, for not only the, the first excited zero plus state, uh, but also the second excited zero plus state, which we're very weakly sensitive to, uh, and the state that I've labeled for coal for collective, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, at the end as, as to what that kind of entails. And so here is a uh, comparison uh, from uh, the experimental data, uh, which is on the left uh, in a level scheme form uh, to two different theory calculations, which are on the right. Uh, and so you can see the general structure uh, is we have a zero plus ground state, the first excited two plus state, and then this triplet of states, which under the vibrational framework uh, would be the two phonon excitation, uh, and then uh, a six plus state that's higher up. Uh, and so both of these calculations kind of succeed in some places and, and don't succeed in others. Um, both of them seem to get uh, the signs of the quadrupole moments for the first and second excited two plus states correct. And the magnitudes are certainly within, uh, within the right kind of ballpark. Uh, the, the BMF calculation, uh, which is the same kind of calculation as was used in, in Paul Garrett's PRL in 2019, uh, the multiple shape coexistence one, uh, gets the the magnitude of the excitate or the the decay from the second excited two plus state reasonably close to experiment, uh, but tends to over predict the energy uh, of basically everything uh, by by kind of a factor of one and a half to two, uh, and doesn't seem to be able to describe the excited zero plus state very well. Um, in comparison, uh, the shell model calculation, which is on the right here, using the JJ four five interaction. Uh, gets the energy levels fairly close uh, and, and predicts the strength from the excited zero plus state reasonably well, uh, but seems to under predict uh, the, the, the E2 strength uh, to the second excited two plus state. Uh, and so what, the, what we do now uh, is, is think about the Kumar Klein sum rules that I talked about earlier. And think about which states uh, we can use those on uh, to get the shape information. So in terms of the, the ground state, the zero plus, uh, we, we have everything that we need uh, to get both the deformation and the asymmetry of the zero plus state. Uh, but crucially, uh, for the first time, for this first excited two plus state, we also have the information we need uh, to get the Q squared or the deformation for that state as well. And so you can, you can see that uh, if, if you imagine this red matrix element, uh, this transition to the first excited two plus, uh, zero plus state wasn't there, uh, then we would only have partial information about which transitions this two plus state was connected to. And so we wouldn't be able to be sure that that sum uh, had converged experimentally. And so what I've plotted here uh, is, a, is a comparison uh, for various different states. Uh, so the, 
the ground state, the first excited two plus, and then the nominal triplet of states on the right. Uh, the ratio of the Q squared for that particular state uh, against the Q squared for the ground state. And so this kind of provides a, a global or an integrated view of the E2 strengths uh, for these different states. So obviously for, uh, for the ground state, this ratio has to be one. Uh, and then for the first excited two plus state for the first time, uh, we can plot this ratio experimentally, which is shown in the red. Uh, and then I plotted that against the, the same uh, Q squared, but calculated uh, by various different theoretical models. So the dark blue, uh, which is the one at the top, uh, is vibration. So this is the, the harmonic vibrator that I, excuse me, uh, that I introduced right at the beginning. And you can see that immediately uh, the, the ratio of Q squareds jump up uh, to 1.4 uh, for the first excited, uh, two plus state and then continue to rise uh, for the triplet of states. And this is in uh, big disagreement uh, with what we actually see in experiment where this ratio actually goes down slightly. Uh, the orange, uh, which is a slightly more uh, sophisticated vibrational calculation, I guess. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the U5 limit of the IBM. Basically the difference between the blue and the orange uh, is that the orange has a finite number of bosons. Uh, and the effect of that is to quench the E2 strength, uh, meaning that this ratio uh, becomes closer to one, uh, but still rises, uh, which we don't see in experiment. And then the other three, uh, the green is a geometric uh, triaxial rotor model. Uh, so this is essentially a rigid rotor with triaxiality. Uh, and because it's a rigid rotor, uh, these Q squared values are uh, essentially defined to be one. Uh, and then, uh, the JJ45, which is the shell model uh, and the beyond mean field calculation as well, uh, both for the first excited two plus state uh, give ratios of approximately one. Uh, and then of course the, uh, the delta, uh, which is the triaxiality. So this is kind of the second uh, shape parameter that we can extract for the ground state. Uh, experimentally indicates a triaxiality or an asymmetry parameter uh, of 29 degrees, uh, which is almost perfectly triaxial. Um, and so, I mean, it, essentially the takeaway from this, this figure is that both vibrational models uh, are excluded by the experiment. Uh, and the closest that we have to agreement uh, is all three of the other models, which are all consistent uh, with rotational character for that first excited two plus state. And so a few things, a few slides to, to wrap up. Uh, this is kind of a more global view uh, of the cadmium isotopes, if you will. Uh, so you can start uh, at the shell closure uh, with cadmium 98, uh, seeing this sequence of states corresponding uh, to the seniority scheme. Uh, and you can track those states as we add more and more valence neutrons uh, and head towards the mid shell. Then we have uh, a bunch of states in orange uh, which are kind of medium spin J equals four, five, six. Uh, and they all correspond, I believe, uh, to excitations in the valence space. Uh, so various couplings of uh, the protons and neutrons. Uh, and then in, in the, the blue and the green, what I've tentatively, tentatively labeled as the collective structures. Uh, so the zero plus states uh, being intruders, uh, which is perhaps debatable. Uh, and then the green, which is tentatively labeled as a quasi gamma band, uh, starting from uh, the, the interpretation given by Paul Garrett uh, in that PRL with multiple shape coexistence. And what's interesting is that in cadmium 106, uh, this four plus state that I've circled here is the one that we see quite weakly in experiment, uh, but we do see it. Uh, this is not the second excited four plus state. It's not even the third excited four plus state. Um, and so somehow we are skipping uh, these lower excited states that are lower in energy to preferentially populate uh, this four plus state. And this basically speaks to the selective nature of Coulomb excitation as, as a mechanism uh, that it likes to excite uh, collective states rather than non-collective states. And so the fact that we see this at all tells us something uh, about this four plus state, namely that it is somehow collective in character. And so that's why it's been uh, assigned uh, to this to the sequence of states uh, that continues uh, towards the mid shell. 
Uh, and so to wrap up, uh, I basically want to return to the to the perspective uh, that I that I laid out at the beginning, uh, going from seniority to spherical vibrations uh, to deformed collective nuclei, uh, and and the the triplet aside, right? These these higher excited states aside, we don't really have enough collect information on those states to be able to say much definitively about their character. Uh, but we can ask the question uh, very basically at the at the first level: uh, Is the first excited two plus state uh, consistent with a one phonon vibration uh, in cadmium one hundred six? And so we might look at uh, the ratio of the four plus energy to the two plus energy, uh, and two point three six is what that value is uh, experimentally for cadmium one hundred six, which of course uh, lies between uh, the the uh, the limits uh, of one and a half for seniority with pairing and 3.33 uh, for rotations. Uh, this is, however, closer to rotations uh, than the vibrational value of 2.0. Uh, and so it's, you know, if, if vibrations are there, it would seem sensible that we've already passed them by the time we get to 106. Uh, looking at the B2 strengths, uh, these Q squareds are kind of an integral view of that. And what we see is that uh, the, the experimental value of 0.85 uh, is closest to the rotor value of one, which is consistent uh, with the more sophisticated shell model or BMF calculations, uh, and basically rules out uh, the, the vibrational value of 1.4 uh, or 1.16 uh, for the IBM U5 calculation. Uh, and finally, uh, the, from the Kumar Klein sum rules as well, uh, the, the delta parameter comes out to be 29, uh, which is consistent with triaxiality. And so perhaps uh, the picture that we have of emerging collectivity uh, is going from a seniority scheme picture uh, to a triaxial rotor picture, uh, finally to axial deformation. In terms of where we go next, uh, you can see that uh, the whilst all of these models uh, for, for the first excited two plus state uh, give fairly similar answers. Uh, when we start to go to the higher excited states, to this triplet, uh, we get very uh, rapidly diverging answers. And so having uh, enough experimental information to be able to uh, distinguish between those uh, would be excellent. Uh, unfortunately, what this means is that you really need Coolex data uh, that probes uh, above those uh, states so that you can get the transitions that are populating them. Um, the, I, I also have Coulomb excitation data uh, for cadmium 110 and 116, uh, and this is being analyzed. It's sitting on my desk, uh, and you can see uh, a picture there of the Doppler corrected gamma ray spectra uh, for cadmium 110 uh, and all of the states that are populated or all of the transitions that we see there. Uh, and finally, uh, once again, this high statistics uh, decay of metastable silver. Uh, populating the cadmium 110, uh, providing a, a different look um, to, to give high precision branching ratios, uh, which can be used in concert uh, with the Coulomb excitation analysis. Uh, so uh, thanks to, to all the collaborators who uh, actually carried out the experiment, um, especially Mitch uh, and Andrew Stutchbury uh, and John Wood, who were very helpful with, with many fruitful discussions uh, of the interpretation as well. Uh, thank you for listening. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. Oh, I can't hear you, Robert. I think you're still muted, Robert. So, Goofy, why don't you go ahead if uh, if Robert's having trouble with his microphone? 
Oh. Uh, yeah, very, very nice Sorry. team. Uh, really. You were going to say something, Robert? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that I, I was muted because the computer switched. So, so Augusto, you 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 wanted to ask a question, right? Yeah, nice. Uh, congratulations. So, so, so if I could you argue that these are your reasons and agreement with the models, you will say the triaction. Um, or at least at low means. Uh, how about the odd distance uh, between the right of this guy? I, mean, I, I imagine if, if, if. I'm not sure if it's you or me, but I'm having trouble. 